Um, yeah, my name is Jesse Kate Shingler. I'm working with the Open Lunar Foundation, and we are building spacecraft for the moon to advance cooperative and peaceful futures. So I'm here today to talk to you a bit about lunar governance. Uh, we actually had a salon uh, planned a couple months ago that uh, we weren't able to do, and so I'll try and cover a little bit of that today and um, uh, give you a sense of what's happening in this in this space. So first, I'm just going to start off by giving giving some context about what's happening uh, in the uh, in the lunar ecosystem. Hmm? Got it. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So. Uh, the first thing that I, I think is worth emphasizing, if you if you haven't heard, we are going back. Um, China is going to uh, the South Pole of the Moon. They have announced plans to be there in about 10 years, and uh, they have a, a program of, of spacecraft that are going to explore uh, sample return and resource utilization uh, in support of having a human outpost on the South Pole of the Moon uh, by the 2030s. Uh, and of course, America has recently announced that um, they're going back to the moon under the, the title of uh, Project Artemis and would like to have uh, so-called human boots on the moon uh, by 2024. Um, that is all sort of well and good in terms of state activity, but uh, the thing that's really exciting in the lunar uh, sphere uh, that's happening right now is that uh, as we see launch costs are coming down, uh, all the technology innovation and miniaturization that everybody here is quite familiar with, um, what we also see is that there's an explosion of uh, private and commercial actors that are involved in the lunar um, in the lunar activity. Uh, so of course we have the there's big, large actors that you may have heard of, including uh, Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos' um, space company, uh, and SpaceX. Um, but you also have a bunch of these smaller uh, lunar lander projects. Uh, a lot of them came out of the Google Lunar X Prize competition that ended a couple of years ago. It ended with no winner. And so NASA took up the, the mantle a bit there and said they were going to offer contracts to small actors uh, who were able to deliver scientific payloads to the lunar surface um, uh, on a commercial contract. Uh, so there's a few different actors out there that are basically being supported by NASA to um, undertake not, not only these scientific payloads, but also um, commercial customers. Uh, so NASA will pay them a certain amount of money, but then they can have, um, they can have other, other commercial, uh, sorry, as I said, customers buying services to go to the lunar surface. So what we see is, for example, uh, academics um, are sending small rovers to test uh, robotics on the lunar surface. And then you also see some kind of strange um, uh, simple activities such as um, like Japanese companies buying uh, buying a ride to basically take a selfie from the lunar surface for marketing purposes or um, companies sending up ashes uh, to distribute on the lunar surface as a sort of memorial for folks. Uh, so, so there's kind of, there's a slowly increasing um, set of activity, but what we don't see is anything that is really pointing yet to uh, either sustained presence, uh, which of course is, is uh, for those who are kind of excited about the prospect of, of lunar settlement, what we need to see is, is getting to the point where we're actually um, sustaining our presence there and building on the activity that's happening, so not just one-off missions. Um, and we also need to see proximity operations. So the missions that are planning to go up right now are all basically planning to go to different locations and, and have a, a temporal as well as a, a spatial distance between them. So they're going sort of every six months. Um, and most missions are only uh, designed at this time to survive what's called the lunar day. So uh, that is two Earth weeks is, uh, is the time of, is the amount of time that the, that the sun is up on the moon. Uh, and so unless uh, missions bring up their own, um, at, at this time, the, the main solution for surviving the lunar night is, is nuclear power. And since that's not a super popular option, um, most missions are basically uh, designed to be 14 days or less. So that also has implications for the, um, for the sort of affordability of these missions and what you can do during the time frame of these missions. So basically, the big question in the room is, uh, in what's called in-situ resource utilization, uh, or ISRU. It's sort of a fancy way that space people talk about mining. And, um, and the, the big thing about ISRU is that there's really no regulatory framework uh, for handling this. So the main kind of uh, treaty that we have that governs activity in outer space is something called the Outer Space Treaty. And um, uh, to me, this is my favorite uh, piece of, of law. <laughs> um, that basically, I think it's the most radical legislation um, that, that I've ever heard of. Uh, and 
the treaty was developed in 1967, or it was adopted in 1967 uh, at the height of the Cold War. So we have the USSR, we have communism, and we have uh, democratic capitalism. Uh, and what came out of this treaty uh, were, were three, what, what I would say three kind of key tenets that really set us up for um, some of the things that Zarina was talking about uh, in terms of uh, new forms of legal systems that we might be able to take going forward into the future. Uh, the first is a tenet um, or, or an article within the treaty that uh, prohibits national appropriation on the moon uh, and other celestial bodies. Uh, so what this means is that uh, the idea of private property as we tend to understand it in the Western fear, it, sphere is, um, is outlawed by this treaty. Uh, now, that might mean that the treaty falls apart because we don't uh, find ways to operate according to uh, what the treaty requires, or it might mean that we kind of step up to the challenge of figuring out how we can develop new governance and, and regulatory regimes that adhere to the requirements of this treaty. The second uh, is uh, a sort of an access provision. So the treaty requires that, uh, that if there is any actor on the lunar surface or, or other celestial bodies, um, if they have an installation of some kind, that other actors must have access to that. So this sort of, um, uh, this looks very different than the kinds of uh, sovereignty uh, and, and borders and exclusion and the ability to, to keep people out of your borders that we have on this planet. Uh, and, and the third is a tenet that is, uh, the language within the treaty uh, says that space shall be the province of all, it says mankind, but of course um, we would say humankind today. And, uh, and so it's really encoded in, in the treaty itself that, uh, th that we should, whatever we're doing in space should be for everyone. So for me, I really see this as, um, we, we often talk about space as a blank slate, but actually it's not a blank slate. We are able to look at the past and look at what we think uh, we could have done better in the past, and 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 to Zarina's point, and even also to David's point, um, you know, what are the alternative systems that we might be interested in? So, just a few predictions um, in the spirit of the requests that came from Lou and Allison. Um, in November 2020, um, I think that uh, what we will see is that the United States uh, will offer to recognize a specific property regime for lunar resources. Uh, this is motivated by uh, a desire to support commercial activity. Uh, I think we will also uh, see Chandrayaan-2, which is the Indian uh, spacecraft that's in orbit around the moon right now, um, basically announcing the discovery of a water deposit that's large enough to be, to be mined. And that's really interesting because then you, what you might see is a flurry of, of commercial activity and folks pursuing um, getting there first. On approximately a five-year time scale, I would, I would say let's imagine that there's roughly about three commercial actors that are on the lunar surface in addition to and, and most likely ahead of governments actually operating on the lunar surface. Uh, I would say Blue Origin uh, will operate uh, a commercial power utility, uh, which as I was saying, one of the big challenges on the lunar surface is surviving the lunar night, as, as it's referred to. Uh, and so by having a power, power utility on the surface, it would radically change what the possibilities are for, for surface operations. Um, I think uh, we might see the first robotic collision on the lunar surface and then have to ask the question of what do you, what do conflict resolution mechanisms look like, both from remote operations, but also in, a, in an environment where we don't have formal agreements about, uh, about how to resolve these things. Uh, next one, actually, relatedly, is uh, maybe we'll see the first algorithmic conflict resolution standards. And if we did see that, you could imagine that uh, that different missions adopting different algorithms might end up in operating environments that are sort of self-contained because they're using the same algorithm. So you have you might have one location that's using algorithm A and one location that's using algorithm B, and that might result in a kind of implicit zoning happening on the moon. And then I think we might see the first uh, protests on this planet uh, regarding rights and representation in lunar governance uh, and resource utilization. I think we see a lot of um, strong opinions and reactions to what's happening with especially the sort of billionaire actors uh, going to the moon, and, and I think rightly so. Uh, and as we start to see more, more activity, um, I think people are gonna be demanding to, to have a say in that. And then finally, uh, sort of looking a bit further out, I think that what we might see as we start to have people on the lunar surface is that uh, there will be a new moon treaty, uh, uh, which will encode constitutional level rights to mobility, or basically what here we call open borders. 
uh, I think we'll start to see the first in situ institutions, meaning institutions on the lunar surface where uh, they, they only um, give guidance to behavior on the lunar surface. So it's not from Earth and it's not for Earth. I think we will see that large commercial actors uh, maybe start to feel hampered by the very state-focused framework that we have on the Earth. So everything here in the international sphere is all about states and, and companies are not recognized actors in the inter international community. So you can imagine if they're very far away and they're the ones providing most of the services that they might start to say, well, we'd like to actually have the rules operate a little bit differently. And they might actually start to offer rights and protections to people on the lunar surface that don't necessarily fit within the, the terrestrial um, jurisdictional frameworks. So maybe they'll even start to offer a kind of citizenship. And maybe those citizens will mature uh, kind of new notions of sovereignty that are kind of post-geographic or post-territorial, so not about having contiguous pieces of land, but rather about um, respecting certain rights. Uh, and finally, I think that we, uh, I hope that we will see that these experiments, and that A, that they will be experiments, uh, and B, that uh, the permission to try new things in new places will then feed back to this planet and begin to help to create a feedback loop of, of innovation and experimentation. Thanks. I'd love to hear a question maybe from Tom or Zarina, um, since... All right. Uh, I've got two questions, I think. One is, um, uh, do you know of any communities that have attempted to live by this Outer Space Treaty as a way of trying to, like... Uh, <laughs> slash, do you want to do it? Uh, um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, even even by accident, you know, I, I think some of these um, uh, points have been adopted by communities, but maybe not all of them. Uh, and then the second one is, why do you think we have managed to produce something so radical for a, a celestial body that we haven't really got access to, and we've like failed so miserably to apply such wonderful things to our to our own planet? Okay. Well, the, fir the first question I would say uh, no and yes. <laughs> uh, so. Um, no, I don't know of anyone, and yes, I think we should try it. Um, the, to the second question, uh, I think part of what's really interesting is um, for anybody who's interested, the, the Outer Space Treaty is really only about three pages, uh, and it's available online, and I think you should go read it. Uh, but it, you know, because it was developed at, a, uh, at the height of the Cold War, basically, I think what we what it reflects is that people didn't really think that that this was going to happen. <laughs> um, they were not designing a treaty that was meant to actually prepare us for or, or like inform um, really much more active um, operations on other planets. And, and so I think they were kind of hedging by trying, to, by trying to respect each other's frameworks without really planning for, for how that would uh, intersect with reality. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have to take the audience question. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks. That was really good. Um, I guess I have a question about the idea of rights. <clears throat> so my current understanding of like our concept of rights, what? <clears throat> All right. So my current understanding of like our concept of rights, at least in this country, um, is that they extend from like property rights ex actually extend from your individual rights. Because the idea of uh, owning property is really an extension of your mind and your actual labor going into cultivating and creating. Like, that was one of the original ways as you went to a piece of land, you cultivated it, it became yours because of your actual individual rights being infused basically into property. So how do we change the idea of property rights or having no property rights? And then how do you avoid the tragedy of commons in that system? I feel like the people who know me will, will swear that that question was planted because <laughs> um, I think about this stuff a lot. Uh, uh, the short answer is um, I think we can look to uh, common pool resources and common property regimes, and, and that's really what uh, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize for in uh, 2010, I think, uh, was essentially a response to this idea of the tragedy of the commons um, and pointing out that in certain kinds of resources that uh, there are certain kinds of resources where it's actually very difficult to apply private property management regimes uh, 
such as rivers uh, with fish in them or grazing lands uh, where it's it's difficult to exclude access to them in, this, in the same way that like putting a fence around your house makes it easy to. Um, and so what she did is basically study hundreds and hundreds of examples around the world of, of you know, villages and communities that had developed ways of managing the, uh, the sharing of these resources um, that I think can be examples for us in looking at uh, how we might want to manage um, territory or resources on, on other planets if, if we either choose to or find that it is technically difficult to, um, to, to implement exclusion.